Namaste and hello to everyone. Today we continue with the Tripura Rahasya that we have been enjoying for quite a few sessions now. It's one of my favorite texts because of its very unusual nature. It has women teachers who explain the teachings with uh, wonderful allegorical stories and there are some wonderful images that really stick in the mind. The last time we stopped <clears throat> when Himalekha, the princess, instructed her husband, the prince, Hemachuda, and he was so deeply touched by these teachings. Having received the instructions, he directly left for further contemplation on these. I will read a little bit again, repeat from a few verses from 17 and 18 because they are very symbolic. Having received these instructions from his wife, Hema Chuda mounted his horse and left the city. He reached his garden, as beautiful as a garden of Indra, in which there was a crystal temple. He entered the temple. He left all his servants outside and ordered the guards to allow no one to enter while he was contemplating, not even the ministers, teachers or his father, the king. He climbed up to the ninth floor story of the temple. From there he saw the scene all around him. He sat on a cushion made of cotton, made his mind one-pointed and become, began contemplating. During that time he was all alone. I would like to bring to your notice this very interesting symbolism here. He left the city. We have said that this text, Tripura Rahasya, Tripura means the three cities. And the cities, the three cities are the three levels of consciousness. Waking, dreaming and deep sleep. So if this is the city, he's, he's leaving the city, he is performing a certain act I believe symbolically, of the drawing. He reaches his garden, as beautiful as the garden of Indra, in which there is a crystal temple. He entered the temple. So this is this quiet place. A temple in India is also a symbol of the body. We say that the body is your temple. That's why you should take care of the body like the temple is taken care of. It's kept clean, it's pure, and so also you should look after your body, keep it healthy, keep it clean by eating healthy foods and uh, taking good care of it. He ordered no one to enter while he was contemplating. Implies that all the senses all external distractions were stopped. He withdrew inwards. And he climbed to the ninth story of the temple. Well, I of course asked myself, why would they talk about the ninth story of the temple? Normally temples don't have floors as such. But here they speak of the ninth story of the temple, which for me is a very clear indication that it's referring to the ninth chakra. So, the ninth chakra is the Sahasrara chakra, the last chakra. And nobody was allowed to enter there. So, he went up right to the top 
of the temple, which is the ninth floor or the ninth chakra. And there he started to contemplate. He was all alone. Any questions about this so far or any comments? Right, so we can continue. He began to contemplate why are people deluded? No one here knows about the self. People perform actions with the hope of enjoying themselves. Some of them are reciting the Vedas and some are studying the scriptures. Some of them are busy accumulating money. The rulers are engrossed in administration. Others are embroiled in arts or indulging in sensual pleasure. Although no one knows what the self is, people perform actions for their own benefit. Why is there such delusion? Alas, without realizing the self, all activities are theatrical and in vain. So now I am going to contemplate on the self alone. My palace, wealth, kingdom, wife and cattle cannot be myself. They are mine, but none of these are me. Because of ignorance, I feel they are mine. My body is my instrument. I am the son of a king with healthy limbs and fair complexion. Everyone identifies himself with the body. So far, the prince was identifying himself with the body. Body consciousness should be transcended by understanding the fact that this body is mine, my real self is different from the body. Eventually, he stopped identifying himself with the body, which is the basis of attachment. He thought, how can this body be the self? It is composed of blood, bone and other components. It is ever-changing, like wood or a mountain, which decay. Dreams are part of life, like waking and sleeping. If I am not aware of my body in the dream and sleep states, I cannot be my body. The same is the case with my prana, the vital energy. It cannot be my mind or intellect either. My mind and my intellect are my instruments. Undoubtedly, every component of myself, from my body to my intellect, is different from me, the self. No one experiences his non-existence. There is no doubt that I exist. But I do not know through what means I experience my own existence. Why do I not realize it directly? All material objects are experienced through the senses, tangible objects through the skin and mental objects through the mind. Buddhi, the intellect, can be distinguished through its decisive function. But how do I experience myself? I do not know. He was suddenly plunged into great astonishment. Having a glimpse of the self, he was accelerated and started meditating intensely. When the restlessness and the conflicts of the mind were controlled, he saw light emanating from everywhere. After the light vanished, he wondered what it was. Oh, why am I experiencing so many diversities? Curious, he controlled his mind once more, directing it inward. This time, his mind slipped into deep sleep. He shifted from deep sleep to the dream state, where he had many unusual experiences. On waking, he started thinking, Was this all a dream? 
Whatever light or darkness I experienced might have been fragments of a dream. Dreams are imaginary in the mind. How can I go beyond them? Let me now make an effort to control my mind and its modifications. He again made an effort and found himself in deep bliss. After a while, his mind began functioning in the waking state. He wondered, what is all this about? He could not discriminate between dream and hallucination. This experience was beyond his imagination. This unique experience of bliss cannot be compared with the experience I had before. I felt as though I was asleep and not aware of the external world. I found this blissful experience peculiar. I do not see any explanation for this. How did it happen? I am trying to realize the nature of the self, which still remains a mystery to me. I see the Atman in so many different ways. What is all this actually? Is it light, darkness, bliss or something else? Are these appearances of the self in different forms? I am not able to un reach any conclusion. Let me ask my learned wife. She understand, understands these things. So we go back to understand this process that has been described here. He goes into deep meditation and practices contemplation. And this contemplation, if you may have noticed, is a process of, almost a process of elimination. And that's what the sages did, and it's quite a useful thing to do sometimes, is you eliminate everything very logically and say, not this, not this, neti neti. So you see that all the material objects, the palace, the wealth, the kingdom, the wife, none of these are me. They, they are mine, but they're not me. And it's because of ignorance that I think that they are mine. Then he comes to the body. So the body is an instrument. I am the son of a king, I have healthy limbs, fair, fair complexion, but I'm not the body. So he is using this process of elimination. And he realizes the body is always changing, so the body cannot be the self. How can it be the self? It's made of blood and bones, and it's changing all the time, just like wood or a mountain. It decays. That's not permanent, so that cannot be the self. And so the dreams are part of life, like waking and sleeping. And he's not aware of the body in dream and sleep state, so that cannot be the self either. The same with prana, the mind, the intellect. These are instruments. And then he says, yeah, I'm convinced that I exist because nobody experiences non-existence. You can only experience existence. So that itself is a way of applying logic and saying, I must exist. The self exists, but how do I experience this? Why do I not experience it directly? And then he explains that himself. He realizes that all material objects are experienced through senses. And all mental objects are experienced through the mind. What are mental objects? Those in dream state, for example, are mental objects. <clears throat> when you're dreaming and you see in the dream a person, that's a mental object. Or you see a room in your dream, that's a mental object. And this mental object is experienced by the mind and the intellect. So he's, he's still grappling with this idea 
And in that moment, as he was grappling with this idea, he plunged into great astonishment. What does that mean? Plunged into great astonishment. It's somehow, when the mind is grappling with this idea and it seems like not this, not this, not this, then what? It seems in that moment that there are no answers. The mind itself struggles now to understand what is the self. It begins to realize that the self is beyond the mind. How can you understand that which is beyond the mind? Because the only instrument you have is the mind. So in that moment, it seems almost like the mind is paralyzed or it shuts down, you know, for, for just a split second. It's like a moment of astonishment. It's like when you see something really beautiful. Imagine you're standing on top of a mountain on the summit and you see an amazing uh, view. And you go like, wow! Or you, or you see the ocean. I imagine you've seen the ocean for the very first time and you see this vast expanse in front of you, seemingly endless, and you go, wow! It's that wow moment. It's that aha moment. It's like, in that moment, you don't breathe anymore. It stops. The breath stops. It's a moment of astonishment. And having a glimpse of the self, that's what happened in that moment. He had a glimpse of the self. He started meditating intensely. We can go to our nice diagram that we have. And... Have a look there. And you can see this process of elimination once again. And you can see that if you are not these objects in the external world, you know, Emma Chuda said, I'm not, uh, <laughs> I'm not the cattle. <laughs> I'm not uh, my kingdom. I'm not my wealth. I'm definitely not my wife. I'm also not the body. He, he realized he's not the breath. He's not the conscious mind. It's changing all the time. He, he's not dreams. He's not the mind at all. And so, in that moment, when he said he's not this, he's not this, he's none of these things, the mind in that moment seems to stop. There's somehow like a break here. And in that moment, he had a wonderful experience, a very short glimpse of the self. And when you have this very short glimpse of the self, it really is enough, you know, because it, it gives you insights that then convince you and nobody can convince you otherwise. If you have seen the sun and you have seen the light and the power this light has, you know, nobody can convince you that this is not the sun, but it is, you know, a big uh, football in the sky. Because you know it is the sun and it gives warmth and light and life. And nobody can convince you otherwise. And so also when you have seen, even if it was only a split second, that light, that unconditional love, these are the qualities of the center of consciousness. When you have experienced that even for a split second, it motivates you and leaves you longing for more. And that is exactly what happened. He had this brief glimpse and he began then, really, from that point of time, he began really to meditate intensely. And what he saw was, first, he experienced the restlessness of the mind, the conflicts of the mind. That's what is shown here. This restlessness and conflicts, they had to be somehow controlled. And then he, he saw this light. The light vanished, then... 
He again he controlled himself. There were, there were some lights coming when we go inwards. Then sometimes we do experience these lights. There's nothing really amazing about these lights. Um, we say they are part of the tatvas. They are coming from the different levels of chakras, and they are not necessarily any sign of a great state of meditation or uh, development. And he controlled his mind again and he fell into a deep sleep. That sometimes tends to happen because you're not used to meditation, you fall into deep sleep and then the dream stayed. So he was coming back out again and he was going through this process here, as you can see. Understanding now the dreams are imagery, then he went back into deep bliss and then again into the waking state again. So he was still trying to understand what all these things were. What happens is that when you begin to experience this meditation for the very first time, it's a very um, uh, confusing experience because you don't know anything like this before. You have not experienced it before. So imagine you are just thrown in, you're here normally at the conscious mind here, breathing or whatever, and you're suddenly thrown in into this point here. And you see very consciously all the stuff in the active unconscious mind. It's, it can be frightening. And he was not able to distinguish between dreams and hallucination because it's basically more or less the same. It's one, you're conscious, and the other one, you're in bed and you're asleep and you're not conscious. He experienced suddenly bliss here consciously and he, he, was, he was getting confused. He was not able to understand these things because he did not have still a firm foundation of knowledge. So then you are privileged and there's an auspicious moment. In that auspicious moment, you may experience something deeper, something out of the active or the latent unconscious. And you might be confused and you wonder, what is this? And that's exactly what happened to Hema Chuda. Because Hema Leka had, had sort of with her, her, her unusual logic made him contemplate, forced him into thinking in a different way, forced him into questioning conventional wisdom. And when he sat down to meditate, suddenly these things started happening to him. And then he didn't understand it. Now he goes back to his wife because he wants to understand this process and what, what is happening to him. So, any questions so far? So, all these lights, well, for those of you who may be meditating and starting out on this journey and you may see some lights. These lights are really not of a um, great deal of importance. They're coming from the tattvas. These are the elements and uh, not necessarily a sign of great deep meditation. So...
Has anybody seen some lights? <laughs> Emma Tudor is decided that he must ask his learned wife, Himaleka, for guidance to understand what is happening to him. He was not able to understand it nor reach any conclusion. So, he then called for Himaleka to come to him. In an hour's time, Himaleka arrived and climbed up the stairs like the queen of night traveling in the blue sky. There she saw her beloved husband, the prince, whose mind was tranquil, steady and free from all modifications and whose senses were completely withdrawn. She sat down next to him. The prince opened his eyes to find his dear wife beside him. The moment he looked at her, she embraced him lovingly and spoke in a sweet voice. Lord, why did you call me? Are you healthy? Tell me the reason you summoned me here. The prince replied, Darling, after listening to your teachings, I retreated here. To realize the self directly, I started contemplating. I thought that my mind was focused inward, but actually it was not. I was aware of many things other than the self. I can differentiate between the self and non-self. Then I saw darkness, light and many other scenes. And occasionally I felt great joy. What was all this? What was it the nature of the self or something else? Please explain it clearly so that I can experience it directly. At his request, Himaleka, the knower of truth, spoke gently about the world and beyond. My dear, listen to me. Whatever effort you have made to control the external modifications of your mind is very good. All the adepts consider this to be one of the important ways of attaining the goal. Without that, no one would have knowledge of the self. Self-realization does not need any evidence because self-existence, self-existent reality is present all the time. If it is already present, why does it need to be attained? Atman is not attainable through any state of mind. Direct knowledge of the self is the purpose of all sadhana. There is no moment when the self does not exist. That which is self-existent is not subject to attainment. Let me give you a few examples. Suppose something is hidden in the dark. When the darkness is removed by the light of a lamp, then the objects are revealed. That is the case with Atman. Suppose a person hides a cache of gold, then forgets where he put it. He stops thinking about everything else, concentrates on finding the gold. In this way, he finally remembers. This is how one remembers the presence of Atman. Avoid thinking about other objects. Avoiding thinking about other objects is not the reason that the man finds the goal. In the same manner, controlling the modifications of the mind is not the cause of the attainment of the self. You are not aware of the nature of the self. That is why you do not experience it directly. A person who has never seen a lamp may visit a palace at night. He sees the light as well as the courtiers but does not recognize the source of the light. Consider this. After controlling the modifications of the mind, you saw darkness. But before that darkness appeared, there was a brief instant of complete silence and an absence of all objective awareness, including the awareness of darkness. In that state in which you were entirely alone, you are only with yourself. Always think of that state of experience. It is the source of supreme bliss. 
people with outward oriented minds remain unaware of that state learned and skillful seekers continue their search yet do not attain that highly evolved state these seekers worry and become sad for they do not know that state theoretical knowledge of the scriptures can never make anyone adept philosophy of the self is not a mere theory which is subject to discussion self realization is beyond all argument realization of the self is never attained by running here and there stillness is important no matter how far one goes one cannot attain self realization that is attained through steadiness pure knowledge is not realized through mere contemplation it is realized after renouncing all desires but never by performing any action just as one cannot capture the shadow of one of his own head by running after it self realization is not possible through any physical or mental effort a child can see thousands of reflections on the surface of a clear mirror but does not notice the mirror itself similarly in the vast mirror of atman people see the entire universe reflected but remain but do not become aware of atman itself although a person is familiar with the concept of space he will attend to the objects present in space never noticing space itself now lord think of this world of subjective and objective duality at even more subtle level the subjective aspect knowledge is self evident and without it nothing can exist although knowledge of the self is the ultimate source of all valid knowledge it is not the knowledge of any kind of cognition one who denies knowledge has no ground to stand on it is not possible to have a discussion with such a person like a reflection in a mirror everything shines in atman the knowledge of atman is beyond the limitations of time and space self luminous consciousness is the knower and that alone is real just as space appears compartmentalized by physical objects knowledge only appears to be limited by time and space so very profound teachings by himalaya and to sum up some of these teachings before we continue is that the atman cannot be realized merely by performing action it's non action through which we attain atman now this itself can be very confusing and can be misunderstood it doesn't mean now you all stop meditating the what it means is you sit in meditation basically just observe watch as long as you are actively doing something you will not attain or it will not just happen spontaneously so stillness is important you're not going to attain atman through intellectual studies arguments and one of the first examples given was was that of the um the lamp when when something is in the dark you simply bring in light and then you you can see things so the darkness disappears so you don't have to physically remove the darkness you just bring in light or if you have <clears throat> forgotten where your gold is you you will obviously stop thinking about everything else you are only thinking about your gold and when you stop thinking about everything else you will remember where the gold is so also when we stop thinking about the external world and all the desires and we stop running after other things you will remember the true self so this is briefly summarizing some of the very profound 
statements made by Emma This knowledge is self-evident. As I said, it's like the sun. It's self-evident that the light we have here is from the sun and no one can convince you otherwise. So this is not objective knowledge that we, we know all these objects around us through our senses, but it is the very ground we stand on. And if you deny that ground itself, you cannot have a discussion with such a person. So Himalekha continues, O Prince, the pure and still mind can realize the unity and diversity. By realizing the self, one becomes the self. Now I will tell you the means of attaining it. By using your faculty of discrimination, observe the moment between dreaming and wakefulness, as well as the period between two thoughts. With the help of a calm and still mind, the state between the sleep and waking can be understood. In the real self, there is no form, taste, sleep, sorry, smell, touch or sound. There are no senses either. There is no pain or pleasure, no loss or gain. This is the summum bulum, bulum of life. Although it is the source of all, it is beyond all. It is the Lord of all, the Creator, Preserver and Inhalator. So it's a very important little message here. If you want to know the self, you need to observe the transitions between waking and sleep, between sleep and between dreaming and deep sleep. These are the two transitions which are very important or the, the space between the two thoughts. Normally we, we are unaware and from one thought you go to the next thought. But you realize the moment you try to become aware of your thoughts, the thoughts seem to stop. Right? One often talks about this famous story where the master told the student, you can think of anything you want, but don't think of monkeys. And obviously the student started thinking about monkeys. He was only thinking about monkeys. And in a similar way, the moment you become aware of your thoughts, it seems that those thoughts disappear because you suddenly they're very active paying attention they all seem to disappear. So, one of the things you can do to become more self-aware is to observe these transitions. So, as you're going to bed, you try to observe that transition as you're falling asleep. And in the morning, try to observe the transition as you are waking up. Then you catch a dream or two and you remember it. And then you come into the waking state. More difficult, of course, is the transition between the dream state and the deep sleep. For that you need, of course, a much higher level of awareness. Any questions so far? Any comments? The dream, who is aware that the dream is the real self? The dream is not the real self. The dream is part of the active unconscious mind. And who is aware of the dream? Yeah, who is aware of the dream? There is only one who is really aware. And that is the real self.
here is a dream. The dream is in the active unconscious mind. This is the mind itself and your instruments of cognition are inward oriented. They are also instruments of cognition. But there's one person, oh sorry, one aspect which is aware and that is here. That is the one who is always aware. How can we observe the transition between dream state and deep sleep? Yeah, that's now, as I told you, between, this is the transition, yeah, between dream and deep sleep here. And as I said, that's more difficult because for that, you need to have mastered deep meditation and the systematic process that we teach in our tradition going from external to the body, conscious mind, active and latent unconscious, and then out again. And only when you have mastered this process of going in and out, are you able to watch this transition between the active and latent, or between dream and deep sleep. Otherwise, you are not able to watch this transition because you are unaware and unconscious. Even to observe the transition between waking and dreaming is very difficult for most people because of the lack of awareness, because of the extreme tamas which is there in the mind and body. You can try it tonight when you go to bed and you try to observe yourself falling asleep. What will happen is you will not be able to fall asleep. Because the very act of trying to be aware creates a certain amount of tension. And the moment that happens, you will not fall asleep. And the moment you do try, you, you start relaxing, you will be lost in some thoughts. And then suddenly you will be lost in, in your dreams. You will, you will lose that moment. You will not be able to catch it. And the reason for that is you have not practiced Awareness, you have not practiced meditation. The whole process of meditation, of going from external to internal, is basically learning to master awareness. And that is very challenging. It's a challenging process, it's not unachievable, it's been achieved, and it is possible, very much so, but it does require practice and systematic approach. And to understand this process of meditation and to practice it, you obviously need some guidance. This is not something that one can learn from books and websites, and videos. <laughs> okay, so... Yes, so we continue from where we left off. Himalekha is talking about the center of consciousness now. And so she says, although it is the source of all, it is beyond all. It is the Lord of all, the creator, preserver, and annihilator. Let a seeker stop the outgoing flow of mind by turning it inward and remain aware of the self, which is the self of all. Learn not to identify yourself with your thought patterns. Then you will be witnessing the world and its objects as different from yourself. The time is short. Hurry up. I actually like that line very much. The time is short. Hurry up. <laughs> Hema Chuda followed the instructions imparted by his wife literally. literally. For a long time he remained constantly aware of the self. When he came out of Samadhi, he forgot the objects of concentration.
So, Himalaya cursor is at the end. Stop the outgoing flow of the mind. That's exactly what I was explaining to you in this diagram that generally the flow of the mind is always moving outward into the objects of the world towards the body itself of course and everywhere around and we are using the senses of course for that so we are always outward oriented what we need to do however <clears throat> is to turn it around. We need to turn our senses inward and our mind inward. And when this turning around takes place, that is really critical. That is a very auspicious moment. When a seeker understands that he cannot find the answers to these profound questions in the external world. He cannot find happiness in external objects, in that which is changing all the time. He learns, he understands through his experience, through insight, that he must turn inward. And we talked about the three schools of Tantra, right, in the very first session. And I said that, and the, it was given here in the book as well, that the Kala uh, tradition, everybody seeking the highest, but in the Kala tradition, the focus is a little bit on the external practices. And as long as your mind is concentrated on something in the external world, whether it's a ritual, it's a god, goddess, it's an icon... It's, it's even a teacher or some guru. Anything that's in the external world will keep you in the external world. So then we, we talked about Mishra, saying there might be a mix of the two. Then the turning around has beginning to happen and the mind may not have been trained. So you still need sometimes some external crutches. So you need maybe some icons, you need some external guidance but finally when you have clearly understood that you must turn totally inward that is a very very auspicious moment and then you come to the Samaya tradition I am with you and that you need to go inward becomes so clear that you're not attracted to the external at all anymore Any questions about that? With the teaching of Hemalekha, the whole city becomes wise. Isn't that wonderful? Hemalekha now realized that her husband was established in supreme consciousness and she left him undisturbed. After a little while, he opened his eyes and saw his wife. But as soon as he tried to close his eyes and re-enter that peaceful state, his wife caught hold of his hand and spoke to him sweetly. O oh, prince, tell me, what is your plan? What have you attained after closing your eyes? And what have you lost by opening them? I would love to hear about your inner experience. Due to inertia, Himachuda's mind was sluggish. He did not want to talk and spoke with the lassitude of a drunken man. When you have experienced this high 
level of meditation. It's, it's, a, it's, it's been compared to a drunken state and it has often been compared to a drunken state. It's an intoxication, so we say divine intoxication. And we've, all the Indian mythologies often talk about Soma, Soma Rasa. Soma is this, uh, or Amrit, this is nectar, elixir. All these are referred to at a very high level of meditation, which give you uh, joy, eternal happiness, health, wisdom, prosperity, abundance. And these are symbols for that inner experience. It is like a drunken state, a, a state of very pleasant intoxication. And so much so is that there, is a, there are temples in India, temples of Bhairav, Kal Bhairav. We have them... Often in northern India, in Ujjain, for example, there's a very famous temple of Kal Bhairav, where you offer the deity, like in most temples you offer sweets, flowers, coconuts, these are symbolic, you know, offerings. In the temples of Kal Bhairav, they make a very, very unusual offering. Does anybody know what is offered in the temple of no, no one knows. Oh well. Yes, Sri Ram says alcohol, that's true. You offer alcohol. That's the offering you make to Kala Bhairav, which is a form of Shiva. And Kala is time. That is the form of Shiva that goes beyond time. You know, time, space. So he's the destroyer of time. And one who has destroyed time in the state of meditation experiences this divine intoxication. And therefore, this is a symbolic offering where you offer alcohol instead of offering sweets. Though the concept is the same, the experience is also considered sweet. Therefore, in other temples you make offerings of sweets. But Kalabhara being a very tantric deity and uh, going against, you know, a conventional approach, demands an offering of alcohol. It is very similar to the Christian tradition where also you, uh, you, you have the symbolic uh, wine and um, wafer, which is a symbol of the body, of Christ, and, and the wine at the other end is the highest chakra, and the body at the other end is the lowest chakra. So also a very nice way of combining the first and the last chakra, therefore the body and the wine. The body is of course the wafer, form of food and the wine, as in that intoxicating experience of divinity. So Hemachuda's mind was sluggish. He, he was in a state of bliss, like a drunken man. He said, Sweetheart, for the first time in my life, I am at peace. I find no satisfaction in external activities. These external activities are as tasteless as the pulp of sugar cane after the juice has been squeezed out. I do not need them. I was blind before and did not experience this transcendental peace. Uh, a wonderful uh, image here, the sugar cane, for those of you who've not had sugar cane juice, the cane is squeezed out 
And what is left at the end is just pure fiber, the sugarcane fiber. And that's completely useless. It's, it's imagine it's a bit like having, it tastes like wood, you know, it's like, uh, it has a similar structure. So it's completely useless. The sweet juice has all been squeezed out. And it's a great example because that sweetness is, is gone and it's only the the waste product that's left. And so he compares all external worldly activities with the waste product without the juice in it. Like the man who did not realize there was a treasure hidden in his house, I was wandering, I, and who wandered begging, without knowing this ever-present bliss, I considered sensual pleasure to be satisfying and paramount. I see now that worldly pleasures are fleeting and laden with misery. I kept running after worldly pleasure without discriminating between pain and pleasure and did not find any peace at all. Alas, due to lack of discrimination, people find only pain and misery in the name of attaining happiness. I do not want to endure my self-created miseries anymore. I pay homage to you with this respectful gesture of my hands. Be generous with me and leave me alone. I want only to rest in blissful Atman. Alas, it seems as though you are unfortunate, because even after realizing this state, you are still caught, experiencing the pains of the world and not enjoying the bliss. That wise lady answered with a smile, My lord, you do not seem to have attained that pure state. So what has happened now? It seems almost like the tables have been turned. Finally, Hemalekha, after teaching him, giving him all these wonderful uh, treasures, he has completely transformed to such an extent that he has now no interest in the external world. What has happened? If we go back to our diagram and we see this, then we can understand here that the prince, who was very focused in all his sensual pleasures here in the external world and at the level of the body, completely transformed and went inward, acquiring a taste of this beautiful, blissful taste of, of pure consciousness. Having acquired this, he no longer wanted to go back here to the external world. What is another word for that? If somebody only wants to stay here and not go back outside, what do you call that? Somebody who does not want to go back. Um, yes, yeah, sannyas would be one way of putting it. Yes, it's nivritti mark. When you go inward, it's complete sannyas. It's not sannyasa as in external renunciation. It's not as if you, you have taken vows and wear an orange garb, a costume, but sannyas as in vairagya, param vairagya. For that you don't need to, to take any vows or um, be, have a certain lifestyle. You can be a great jnani, a highly accomplished master, adept without having, having um, taken these vows. Brahmacharya, um, yes and no. Brahmacharya has again two meanings. Somebody who takes again vows of Brahmacharya uh, may not necessarily be going inward, but somebody who walks in Brahman, because that's what Brahmacharya really means, walking in Brahman. Yes, then he is walking in Brahman. And Palaji says, leaving the body and being in Atman is absolutely correct. Such a one who does not want to return back into the world will the body will die. Such a person will die having 
no more interest in leaving the world. That would be then Kevalya, freedom from all this. You become a witness. Yes, Mita, that's also absolutely true. You become a witness. But is that the highest state? Moksha? Yes, uh, Shafani. So you see, there are many words for this. What I was getting at is that the prince does not want to come back into the world. And Himalekha says to him, Hey, is this now the highest? Is this what you have learned? You have not attained the highest, she says. So there's, there's still a catch. There's still more. Because he does not want to go back into the world. So next Saturday we shall find out further from him, Aleka, why he has still not achieved the highest. Why he has not achieved, attained that pure state yet. Mm -hmm. So, Shibu says, Prince does not want to lose ecstasy. Yeah, he, but, but he is denying the world. There is still a version M, Stavani. Yes, there is there's then a sense of the world is not consciousness. And so there's a still higher state. But that we talk about next time when Himalaya will tell us more about it. And we can wait eagerly until then. It was nice having you all. I hope you enjoyed yourself as I did. Bye, Perry. Bye, Shabu, Stefan.